So, notes in hand, we shall begin again. We have designed PI and PD controllers, so we know how to do them both. Now let us include all three terms in a single PID controller. With this, we can design for both steady state and transient response. Here is a block diagram from Nice uh, and a transfer function representation of the controller. So we have no room for notes. Try right there. So our transfer function representation of the controller is that we have a proportional gain plus we have an integral term here with a gain of its own plus we have a differentiator, a derivative term with a gain of its own. And together, these three terms, I want to try that again. I'm not in love still, but in any case, that box becomes our controller. And we could think of it in this block diagram-y way of what's going on inside the box. Or we could think of that whole box as being this transfer function. Now, we aren't used to seeing transfer functions with all of these summations in them. Uh, we should probably rewrite this. So let's get a common denominator. Um, uh, one way to write this would be as the ratio um, everything over s factor out the k3 um, and inside uh, we're gonna have an extra s term so we're gonna have s squared plus k1 over k3 s plus k2 over k3. I don't think that 2 is very clear. k2 over k3. All right. So, uh, It's, I guess the, the, the point is to show that there is one pole and two zeros. Um, so one pole here, two zeros up here. Um, we couldn't see that very easily when we had it in this representation. It's kind of hard to see that. So when we rewrite it here, we see that there are... Is there a reason you pulled up the uh, not necessarily. Okay. Um, it's kind of standard to write second order transfer functions with the term at the front of the squared part, uh, of the squared s as unity, as one. So, yeah, not necessarily. So we have, yeah, uh, one pole in the, d in the denominator and two zeros. Uh, one zero and the pole can be specified by an integrator design and the other zero can be specified by a derivative design. So we got to specify those two poles and we got to specify, or sorry, the two zeros and we got to specify the one pole. So we do a PI um, and that specifies one of the zeros and the pole and we do a PD or, uh, or we add the derivative to do the other zero. So we end up with two zeros we've located places and one pole we've located places. 
that's the the method of proceeding, or at least the idea of what we want to do. Um, PID control requires active compensation, of course, because of its pure integration and derivation. This is the most well-known type of controller and is used extensively in situations that require hand tuning by a non-engineer, um, or just really even if it's by an engineer, but not a controls person. Um, it is in fact quite good for a number of applications and shouldn't be ignored simply because it is sort of cliche to just always use PID. I mean, it's like everybody is just going to default to using PID and we shouldn't, we shouldn't allow ourselves to feel a bias against it just because we know other types of controllers. <laughs> It's not a bad controller, it's pretty good. Um, but also, we shouldn't fall into the hole of thinking it's the only thing out there to, to, to use either. There's lots of other types of control, um, some of which we've already learned, but uh, we will continue to learn more types as well. Um, OK, so any questions before we start the des that design procedure for doing PID control? This is one. This is one uh, way of designing PID controller. There are actually many ways of doing it. I like this one. This is the one Nice uses. It's the one I first learned, so it's probably the one that I'm just most comfortable with. But I, I think that it's one of these things that it just depends on what you learned first as for, as for you know, which is the most, which is the easiest or most intuitive. So um, here are the recommended steps. Step one, evaluate the transient performance of the system with proportional control. Okay, so there's that. Uh, design a PD controller to improve the transient response. So let's, you know, go through those steps that we've learned. Um, then simulate the system to check the transient response requirements. Okay, so same step as before. Nothing's new as far as designing a PD controller and redesign and tweak if needed. And then we move on to step five, include integrator compensation as in PI controller design, which if we do it correctly, if we do it well, um, and you know, uh, uh, system willing, not every system is going to allow us to add, add integrator um, uh, compensation without screwing it up too much for us, but in, in most cases, we'll be able to add an integrator without screwing up the transient response, right? That was our whole method that we learned for designing an integrator controller was that it didn't mess up the transient. And that was, that's, now we see why. We're going to design for the transients first, and then we don't want to affect it when we add the integrator. And that's why it's nice that we learned that method of not affecting it too much. And then we determine the gains. Um, I call them K1, K2, and K3. There are going to be three gains. Um, you can cut them different ways. You can either, um, well, as we'll see. I'll, I'll show you more in the example. But you can do different gain definitions. And what those definitions are uh, is if you're hand tuning it, it makes sense to talk in terms of a proportional gain, an integral gain, and a derivative gain. If you're designing like we're doing, um, the controller, it's not useful to think in those terms as far as placing poles. So we're thinking about placing poles, and so that's where uh, that we think in terms of different gains. So when we go through at each step and we're determining what the gain is on the root locus, um, those are not corresponding one-to-one -one with the the integral and the derivative gains, but you can compute them. They're related to each other in the end. We'll just wait till the end and compute them. So we could tell somebody to hand tune, you know, an, an integral one up to a certain amount, a derivative one to a certain amount. You could tell them what to hand tune it to. Uh, simulate the system to check all response requirements and then redesign and tweak if needed. So, We'll use uh, an example from Nice. Um, it's not an example, it's one of the homework problems. When I say example from Nice, I always mean a homework problem because he works out some examples, but I don't, I don't just copy the example. 
I just do one of the. He picks good problems, so I like the problems. So uh, for the Unity feedback system, design a PID controller that will yield a peak time of 1.047 seconds, very specific, and a damping ratio of 0 0.8 with zero error for a step input. What he means by zero error is zero steady state error. It just slipped his mind when he wrote that. So um, we follow the design procedure presented above. So step one, evaluate the transient performance of the system with proportional control. And uh, I guess the first thing to do is we have a peak time spec, right? So we're going to need to know how to use this expression for the peak time. TP is equal to pi over natural frequency times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Um, does anybody recognize the denominator of that expression? Uh, yeah, damp, damp natural frequency, yeah. Damp natural frequency is what we've called it. Omega D. Um, so if we solved for that, if we said this is the damp natural frequency and we solved for it, it would be equal to pi divided by TP, right? And pi divided by TP conveniently almost as if it was contrived to be so, is equal to about 3. You might have wondered why he chose 1.047 seconds. Now you know why. <laughs> it's, that cracked me up when I saw it. I was like, why, why 1.047? Like, I don't get it. Why is he going after that so much? Nice roundish number. So this is the imaginary part of the initial design point. Okay. Remember that if we went back to our second order pole plots and we looked at the, the relationship between the key parameters and the pole locations, that if we had a complex conjugate pair, the vertical, the height, I guess I should say, the vertical component, the imaginary component is omega d. Omega d. So this is the imaginary part of the initial design point. So that's, we want to be uh, at a specific location with our closed loop conjugate pole pair, our dominant pole pair. And we now know from the peak time what the vertical aspect should be. Ooh, spam. So exciting. All right. Um, and we're also going to need to know what the real part is, too. Um, since the required damping ratio is 0 0.8, we know it has to be on a very specific ray from the origin outwards. And so that's going to set what the uh, real part is. And so we can say that omega d, remember from its definition, is omega n times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. And if we solve this, we know zeta. We know omega d. So we can solve for omega n. And that's going to give us, so if we solve it, it's omega d divided by the square root of, of 1 minus zeta squared. And if we plug in 3 for omega d and 0 0.8 for zeta, 
we'll get a round five, which makes um, if we want to know what the real part of our design uh, uh, pulls is is zeta times omega n and zeta is 0.8 so it's four fifths of five, which is equal to negative four. I mean, this is all within f a few decimal places, four point zero zero probably. So uh, that all worked out really conveniently. Also, um, we could have, we didn't even have to really solve. For um, uh, we didn't really have to even multiply this because we had a three four five triangle. Do you guys ever use three four five triangles like statics? Is that when you learned them? Three four five triangles. Three four five. <laughs> I always love it when there's a three, four, five. It's like the most useless thing unless you have a contrived problem. <laughs> we used to make when I was kid, because our neighbors, mm -hmm. my neighbor came out and told me how to make a square when I turned my car around. Oh, measure a three, four, five triangle. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I learned it. Well, I've never framed anything or put up a fence. Now, I did put up a fence, but it was like, um, it's a temporary fence. Was it supposed to be temporary? Uh, yeah, it was. <laughs> it's for my puppy to stay in the backyard, but I got, like, I don't really want this, like, random uh, wire fence in my yard. I just want it for now until it's like I have a yard it's all fenced but it's just not all fenced well but we can't like I we can't currently fix all of it so I was like I'll just make the problem smaller <laughs> so so I did and I used the house as as part of the fence <laughs> and I put these little it took me a weekend still, but I put these little uh, side fences and I made a gate out of two by fours. And I, all, all you know, said and done, I have to admit, I was pretty impressed. I didn't have a, a, a fence stretcher, so like I couldn't make it nice and straight, but I did a pretty good job. I like, I was out in the yard and I, I, I got one to cobble the fence stretcher together, which was me. And on the other end, so these wire fences, you know, they come in a roll, and they're horrible to work with. And you can, you can crimp them, like, on accident so easily, and they'll never get straight after that. So I was trying, you know, per one person, I was trying to do this, and I, so, like, I unrolled it and cut it, and then I uh, got, like, every garden tool we own, and and I and I stuffed them into between all of the all of the spacing and uh, and then I on the other side I stapled a two by four to the other side something to hold on to and, and I just pulled on it with all I could I could pull and it did straighten it out pretty I mean like not bad it, it was a lot better than it was at least so it's not as it's not as uh, as uh, curved as it could be. Bit. Yeah, I did zero calculations for this project. <laughs> I think I did. I think at one point I subtracted two from six or something like that, and I was like, "Ooh, calculations." <laughs> yeah. All right. That was that project was conceived of, and all the materials purchased at the hardware store in one go.
I was like, okay, so I'm going to make a fence. <laughs> and I walked around the hardware store for two hours, collecting materials, putting things back, getting other things. Yeah, it was, it was great fun. I put a gate in, and the gate even works. I was really dubious about the gate. I was like, I don't think this is going to happen. Like, this gate is not going to work. What? That would have been nice. I built my own. I built my own. And I only wasted probably two linear feet of two by four. And you got to buy these things in, like, I forget what the length comes in. 12 foot? Something like that. 12, 8, 12. Sorry? You can get them both 8 and 12. Maybe, maybe you got them in 8. Maybe I got him in eight. I think I got him in eights. So yeah. I did a four by four square gate. And yeah, it's great. It's actually not bad. Like I have to admit, I'm slightly proud of the of the gate. I keep mentioning it. You can tell. Okay. So let's get back to this. Um, Okay, so we've computed now finally where our design point is, right? That's, that's at negative 4 plus J3. Uh, we just take the positive side to work with, uh, which is not on the root locus. So if I look at the root locus, we'll go over to MATLAB in a second. We look at the root locus, it goes, uh, the, the two open loop poles are at negative 4 and at negative 1. And they meet in the middle and they just go vertical. So we've got uh, as close as we can do. So our, our damping at point 0.8, we can get to that point. We can get our damping fixed correctly. But we want to be at negative 4 plus J3, which is out here, negative 4 plus J3. So this is where we want to be. So. Now, let's design the P-controller such that it meets the damping ratio criterion. So that's what we're going to use MATLAB to do. So we'll switch over to MATLAB. And you just got to embrace the MATLAB, OK? Just embrace the MATLAB. In this class, you just got to. You just got to embrace it. OK. So you I mean, you may notice that every single lecture so far has been accompanied with a MATLAB script. <laughs> Just kind of embrace it. So I put in our, you know, our parameters, our, our specs. TP should be 1.047. Zeta should be 0.8. So I computed what the imaginary part should be, the real part should be. So all the stuff that we just did. And then I compute that STP should be, STP should be, negative 4 plus J3, approximately. And uh, I build the system, the proportional design system. Sys P is going to be the, for the proportional design. Um, negative 4 and negative 1 are our two poles, open loop. We're going to do a root locus on that. And I'm going to specify to go in small increments up to 20. Um, and so. I do that, and this is my root locus. And I have to get a damping of 0.8. Oop, going the wrong way. So we, oh, we passed it. OK, so a gain of 5.76, approximately. So we get k equals 5.76 and let's say where it's at. It's at negative uh, 2.5 plus J 1.87. So SK is at negative 2.5 plus J 1.87. Okay. 
So that's uh, our proportional design, uh, as good as we can do with our proportional controller. At least, at least it meets one of our specs, it meets the damping. So we've got that. Now, is that a PD controller to improve the transient response? Now we're going to do, just like we did before, we had to design the PD controller. So our test point is negative 4 plus J3. We need to place the PD0 such that it contributes an angle of theta equals 45 degrees. I say that I say that um, but I really was just using uh, this calculation just like before. I just plugged in our test point into that formula and I say theta C times 180 over pi is about 45 degrees. So I got to contribute 45 degrees and so our zero using let's see again that formula should be about negative seven in order to contribute that. So our zero location then is Uh, yes, there we go. Is then ZC equals, and then we could plug in, you know, the formula imaginary part of our test point negative four plus J three divided by tangent of. 45 degrees plus the real part missed plus the real part of negative 4 plus J3 equals about negative 7 and then once again I, I did the calculation in MATLAB and I just printed it out but you can see what the what they were then I need to build a system model of the new open loop transfer function. Notice how often we use this ZPK idiom. Uh, it's because it allows us to build a model with exactly the zero, exactly the pole that we want, without thinking about what that means for what the transfer function would look like. I like using this idiom. It removes the human error that's often introduced when I think I know how to do that in my head. Um, I know how to do it in my head like nine out of ten times, but that tenth time I screw it up, and then that's 20 minutes of me floundering around not knowing what's going on. So I do recommend using ZPK. And then, so that's our compensator. So the G stands for a, uh, a transfer function. The C stands for a compensator, and the D stands for a derivative, so a derivative compensator. So I'm going to cascade that together with my original proportional system. Okay. Um, notice something. I did not include the proportional gain in SysP. Okay. So I'm cascading it without the original proportional gain in there, which was on purpose. Otherwise, I have to keep track of all of my gains along the way. I just blew away the first gain. That's fine. Otherwise, you've got to keep track. I don't like keeping track. You can do it. It's six or half a dozen, but I don't like to, I don't like to do it that way. So adjust the gain to get close to our desired closed loop poles. So now we've got our new and improved, hopefully, root locus. Notice we stuck our zero out here, and instead of going straight up and down, this root locus wangs way over there. 
pretty sweet. What's it going to do eventually? Like, so I didn't draw the rest of it. Well, what happens? What must it do? It's, yeah, it's, uh, at least it's going to close. It's going to, I don't know what the shape is exactly. Circle or probably some sort of ellipse or something. Uh, it's going to come down. It's going to meet the axis somewhere out here. One of the poles is going to come to this zero and terminate. The other one's going to go off to negative infinity. Yeah. Pretty wild, huh? Pretty wild. Because you don't have locus here, so remember the real axis rule. No locus, locus, no locus. This whole axis after negative 7 better have a locus on it. And the only way to do that, and for one pole has to terminate at this zero, and the other pole has to terminate at infinity, one has to go off on the real axis to negative infinity, and the other one has to go to that zero. So, anyways, so good times, but we so we could we could make this thing over damped too. Notice if we want it to, and faster. So you could make it over damped by low gain. You can make it under damped by increasing the gain, and then if you keep increasing the gain, you're going to make it over damped again, which is kind of interesting. But we don't want it to be over damped. We want it to be, have a very specific damping of 0 0.8. And we can find that. Jeez, that's slow. Getting there. So we are 0 0.8. So somewhere around here. Oh, my goodness. We found our, our test point, negative 4 plus J3 with a gain of 2.99. Oh, and even the gain of 3, it still works with the decimals. Goodness, all the numbers are working out so well on this problem. It's almost like somebody designed this problem to work out like this. OK, so we have a, uh, now we just need to use the root locus to find the proper gain for our test point. MATLAB gives 3. So there we go, gain of 3. So we have been able to achieve our test point as a location of the closed loop poles for the PD controller. Sweet. So that was, that was our step two. Now, we want to simulate the system to check the transient response requirements. It's getting a little washed out, but um, we have in blue the proportional controller, and we have in red the PD controller. So notice that it appears that our, so our peak time um, is supposed to be 1.0 something, right? So essentially one second. Um, our peak is actually happening a little earlier than that. So usually when you're designing for a quick response, you don't mind being a little quicker. That's OK. Um, and our steady state response got better. Uh, our steady state error got better, which, once again, is, is accidental. We didn't intend for that to happen, but it did happen. But it's still not great. I mean, we still, this should actually be at 1, and it is at 0.85-ish. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> peak time of about 0.8, which is better than the target. And we have around 5% overshoot, which corresponds to a damping of about 0.69, which is not 0.8, but is close enough to proceed. So we could, at this point, try to adjust. Um, I'm saying we don't need to tweak. We can, we can barrel forward with this uh, and, and, and go from there. So now, when he says damping of 0.8, it is sort of odd because once you add a compensator, it's no longer a second order system, right? So once again, we're doing an approximation. So there is no longer a damping ratio associated with this system in a strict sense. But we can think of it as being a certain overshoot 
corresponding to a damping ratio because the, the overshoot is still defined, right? Overshoot is defined for any order of system. So we can still think of it as being a damping ratio. All right, so now we're going to try to fix our steady state error problem. That's what we want to do next. Uh, include the integrator compensation as in PI control. So uh, let's place the integrator 0 at negative 0.1 and see what happens. So we, when we do integrator control, our method is put the integrator in, the pole of the origin in. Step two, put a zero in that's close to it to cancel out its effects on the transient response. How close? Well, it kind of depends on how much that uh, pole is going to affect your, your response. Now, or, or the zero is going to affect your response. And I, I recommended the guideline of dividing the closest pole by 10, I think it was. Um, that's one way to go, or you can just stick it somewhere close to the axis. Um, remember, the closer you get to the axis, the slower your transient's going to get, because you're going to end up with a closed loop pole that's close to the axis. So the further to the left you put that zero, the faster it'll respond, but you're also going to affect the transient response more and more. So you're no longer going to have your root locus going through the test point anymore, which might be fine, but we just have to, you know, there's some, there's some uh, trade-off there. Um, so let's do a third root locus with that. So, uh, so we simulated and checked. It's not bad, but um, obviously we want to get better than that. So that was just a comment about the redesign and tweak thing. So let's add in the integral compensator. Okay. And we do so by sticking it in in this fashion, like we did before when we did integral control. And we multiply it by in series with the system that includes the, the uh, derivative, so the PD system. We just multiply the integral control by that. And then we uh, looks like I stuck in I stuck in a pole at zero. And I stuck in the zero at negative one. So we're going to start off with negative point one. Like I said. So negative point one. And we're just going to see what the root locus looks like. OK, not much different, right? That was our intention. So, but you, if you zoom in here, you can see there's our integrator pole at the origin. There's our 0 at negative 0.1. But notice, I mean, it, no matter what gain we end up with, I mean, the gain of decent amount, we're never going to get to the left of negative 0.1 with this closed loop pole, right? Even if we keep increasing the gain, it's going to stop. The buck stops at zero, right? It doesn't go beyond it. So we're always going to end up with this closed loop pole that's near the axis, and we're going to have pretty slow uh, responses. So I predict that that's going to happen. Um, the gain of 0.3 is what we get if we come in here. It, essentially, that was a tweaking. We say, okay, it was it was close uh, or to three before, and to get back right on our design point, we have to go to three point. What did I say? Zero nine. Okay. So then we des define the closed loop PID control as being this. So just using the feedback function again, convenient. 
and we've got it. Now, that is totally defined. We can also determine the gains, K1, K2, and K3. We usually would go ahead and uh, do our simulation next, but I compute K1, K2, and K3 because I want to print them out on the plots, so that's why. Or I want to print them out so we can see them prettily. Hold on, so are K1, K2, and K3 the three gains that you got from just the whole process? Uh, so they're not. So actually, they are, the, the three gains are, um, there's an algebraic expression that, did I put it? Let's see. Yeah, I think, let me go back up here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's actually, it's, um, So K3 is the, the PID K, the very last K that you tune is this K. This is K3. And then if you want to know K2 and K1, you have to divide this coefficient and this coefficient by K3. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm actually automatically extracting those two coefficients in a very non-obvious way, but you can do that actually in MATLAB. You can extract them from the, uh, uh, the transfer function. Extract the coefficients and then okay. divide them by K3 and that gives you what K1 and K2 are. So that, that we do and so give us our compensator and it gives us our K1, K2, and K3 which uh, I mean, it's pretty cool I mean, that we can do it automatically. It's nice. So we can tweak it, and then it'll recompute these. Because I don't want to do them by hand every time. <laughs> so anyways, that little bit of code is kind of, kind of a nice little tidbit. But then we want to simulate everything, so let's do that. Let's simulate. Ha! Proportional controller, PD controller, a little better. PID controller, we got better, uh, our, we got essentially the same transient response, which we expected, and then it was really slow oozing back to steady state. So we did reduce our steady state error to zero. If you simulate it out long enough, you'll see that. Um, but it's pretty darn slow. And, and the reason it's so slow is that we chose our zero to be so close to the real axis. Okay? And, uh, this is what I, pretty much what I say here. Um, try negative 0.5 or negative 1. Um, and yeah, so if we move it to negative 1 instead of negative 0.1, we get this result. So let's, let's do that. Uh, if we move that 0, well, you have to do a little bit of tweaking. Say you move this zero and then you find KPID, let's just say it ends up being about the same. It'll be close, right? We're not going to affect the transient too much. So say it's that still. We'll recompute this. Those end up being the same and we re-simulate it. And that looks a lot better, right? We didn't really sacrifice, we, we sacrificed a little bit maybe of our transient, but not too much, if anything. Um, looks pretty good. And this is a much better response than the other one that takes a long time to get to zero. Okay. So that was essentially the whole the whole process. Um, we did it. We, we designed a PID controller, and we got a pretty darn good response, uh, pretty pretty good outcome from it, without a whole lot of thrashing around. Um, you just have to you have to realize that the without a uh, without a design procedure, these problems are really difficult because you wander off and you you change one thing and then it changes something else and then you're just like.
playing whack-a-mole and you just can never get everything to fit. And you, uh, yeah, if you follow the design procedure, it'll help you a lot. But don't be afraid to deviate from the design procedure. Call an audible every once in a while, okay? It's not, it's not a design procedure that's flawless and you sometimes you have to go back and re-loop and try something a little different. Like, for instance, um, you know, maybe in some problems you can get away with sticking your zero, you know, way to the left. Uh, in this problem, our, our open loop poles are at, what are they at? I forget. Uh, negative one and, and negative four. Um, so actually what we did with that zero is we canceled that pole, right? Uh, which you can do. You have to be careful. Canceling poles. Um, so, little sidebar. Got to do it quickly. You can cancel a pole that is unstable and make your system look stable. Okay? What's stable? It's a really good question. <laughs> so, if if you can manage to never excite that mode and give it an initial condition, um, then you're good. So in simulation, it, it'll look stable. Okay. Uh, however, in reality, it's not stable, and it, what it is is that you can't. Uh, you can't technically excite it based on your model. You can't excite it from your input, okay? But if it has any initial condition at all, the response will go off to infinity. And so expecting that it'll hold perfectly still in that, un, uh, 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 that unstable dimension uh, is unrealistic. And you'll always end up with some initial condition in there that'll happen just randomly, and it'll go off to infinity. So it's like it's like operating a uh, an inverted pendulum, like a one-dimensional inverted pendulum, and you cancel out the one that tells you that it's unstable tipping-wise, and it says, oh yeah, well in the other axis you can just operate, you can just go back and forth as much as you want, totally stable. See, you cancel to that. It's totally stable. Um, but eventually that thing's going to tip a little bit, right? A little bit. And then it's going to go flying off. So you can't just assume that just because your, uh, your transfer function, if there's a pole zero cancellation, you better make sure that wasn't an unstable pole that canceled. Because you can get big problems that can come out of that. If it was a safe pole, uh, it, there's no issue in the sense that there's no hidden, hidden uh, uh, ugliness there that could happen. Yeah, so you're, I mean, you do see those dynamics still, so you should be aware of that, but they're not unstable dynamics, which is your biggest concern. Okay, so that is it for PID.